oh my gosh, I can't believe you trust me to preach, but here I am. I am so happy to be here with you guys tonight. I'm just here worshiping, and I'm just like, man, isn't God so good? I don't mean to get all sappy right up front, but man, God is so good. (laughs) It's so good to be in the house of God, or the senior center of God. It's just good to be with you guys and worship him. There's something powerful when we all come together and we just praise the name of Jesus. This is what eternity is going to be like, so we're just getting a head start. But yeah, I'm happy to be here with you guys. Um, I don't know if anybody doesn't know me. I hope at this point that you do. But if you don't know, I'm Pastor Vic, brand new to this church, been here, I don't know how long at this point, yeah, a little bit, but uh, brand new to uh, this area, Robbinsville. We came from Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, Pottstown, it was like an hour away, and now we're here, transplanted, it's crazy, me and my family, so if I don't know you, please come talk to me after service, I'd like to get to know you a little bit, but everybody looks familiar here. Um, okay, who has base camp? All of us, right, everybody's like, who checks base camp? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> everybody should check base camp, because you probably saw at some point these past two weeks that somebody lost a laptop, did anybody see that? Did anybody see that? No? Maybe? Guys, you have to check base camp. <laughs> this was on base camp, so he said, we reached out, and we were like, hey, did anybody find a laptop? Can you guess which knucklehead lost the laptop? <laughs> this was your boy, Pastor Vic. So I was given this laptop. This is a temporary laptop that I'm going to use to perform pastoral duties, studying and all these th- things I need to do to do the job well. They're, they're giving it to me. I was like, wow, this is very nice. Lost it when we were packing up or something like that. We were talking at the end of service, and I went home. I went all the way home, and I, my, I looked at the passenger seat, and I was like, uh-oh, it's not here. Where is it? And so I actually drove back, because we're only 10 minutes away, so I just did that. Drove back here. Nobody was here, and I'm looking around. I'm like, it's going to be here. I'm looking all around. It wasn't here. It was not. I... I moved, I, whatever the heck is under that table, I checked under that table. I looked everywhere. I asked her if she knew where it was. She <laughs> didn't know. I'm telling you, it was nowhere to be found. And that night, I was like, okay, I'm not going to stress, although I am stressed. <laughs> there was like a deep, like, okay, this is not good. And instantly, I'm thinking, they're going to fire me. That's it. Job's over. We're going back to Potsdam, PA. It's all over. Uh, I go back home that night, and I'm trying to relax, you know, but whatever. I was hanging out with Caitlin and tried to forget about it. The next day, we didn't have the opportunity to check. So kind of all day, I was like, oh, my gosh, where is this freaking laptop? And uh, then we had the opportunity to check the following day. And I actually came back here with Pastor Dan. He was like, let's check, let's check in there one more time. In my head, I'm like, it's not going to be there. It was like on the chair all the way in the back. Nobody would have seen it. It got tucked back there when we were doing prayer. And again, guess which knucklehead put it there? your boy, Pastor Vic. So that was, uh, that was a horrible experience, but the moment that we found it, I just saw it, and when my eyes locked on it, it was like ultimate peace. I can't explain, like the knots in my stomach, it was just like, oh, okay. We're gonna be okay, job secured, and we're here. We're not going anywhere, so you guys still have me. But man, that, that relief, that peace, when I found that laptop, there was another moment, uh, Okay, has anybody ever, like, sold or bought a house? You ever done that? I'm going to speak in code because there's some people here that I love deeply that helped me with this. <laughs> but buying a house and selling a house is horrible. It's one of the worst things <laughs> in the world. I absolutely hated the whole process. I loved who I worked with, but, man, it was so stressful. Just like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to go into detail although I want to because I'm angry. I haven't let it go. But, man, selling our house, um, we, had, we sold our house, and um, the buyers, like, uh, my, my realtor was like, oh, you should fix this wall. There was, like, a hole in the wall. He was like, you should, you should change this wall. And I was like, what? It was like bug eyes, like, Boo, what, are you, what are you talking about, change a wall? So I'm stingy. I did it myself, and I basically killed myself. And it, he was like, yeah, you know, paint here and there, do this and that. He was like nonchalantly telling us the things we should do to make sure the house sells. It took so much time. The paint colors didn't match. I was like painting till like 1 a.m. I was just like losing my mind. And then eventually searching for a house in this market and like buying the house and the, oh, the haggling. Don't even get me started. It was such a stressful experience. But once we finally, that moment, we like closed on our house and we 
closed on the house that we bought at like the same time. Once that happened, we were we were at our staff retreat, and I, we were like trying to have dinner, and I was just getting up every second to go on a call, like talking with my realtor, and I wanted to like throw the phone out the window. But when it finally happened, it was finally over. I felt like, oh my gosh, like we're at, now we're here, now we're living here, we're in this area. God knows what He's doing, and I was so at peace. What I had been longing for to be here, to be a part of the community, to be in the area and not have to travel <laughs> like an hour and 15 to get here, it finally happened. And it was just incredible. So like praise God for those things. But I bring these things up because how many of us can relate to those moments when you were a knucklehead and you lost something and you found it and that like, oh my gosh, thank the Lord I found it. Ultimate peace, uh, what you'd been longing for, you actually, you actually found and satisfies. Can I tell you, Jesus <laughs> satisfies the deepest longings of our heart. It is Jesus. Um, we're going to take a look at scripture today. Um, we've been in a series, uh, uh, hopefully you guys have been here to see it, but the series, uh, The Shepherds, was the first message that Jesus came especially for you. The second message m- last week was Mary. God uses ordinary people for extraordinary purposes, this idea of favor. I mean, we don't deserve this stuff, but God still chooses to do it. Praise him. And this week, we're going to talk about the Magi. Um, so I mentioned uh, the deepest longing. Oh, I didn't mention this, but I do want to tell you. The deepest longing of every human heart is not to find their laptop, not to buy a house. <laughs> the deepest longing of every human heart is to be loved and to be led. And until those longings are met, we will never truly be fulfilled. And man, isn't that the truth? And I'm going to qualify it. As we read this scripture, we're going to see this is true. It's in scripture here. So um, let's let's first really quickly, let's just talk about who the heck these magi were. When you think about the magi, we're thinking the three wise men. If you didn't put those connections together, those are those (laughs) same people. Um, And there's some interesting facts about them. They were Gentiles. um, And the term magi actually originated from the Greek word magos, which means uh, magician. So these people were magicians, they were astrologists, um, they dabbled in some other things, not necessarily these people, but we don't have to talk about, but some like demonology and things like that. I don't think they were these people. But they were interesting folk. Uh, They were sometimes considered religious advisors, possibly for their court or like the priestly caste. They were wealthy. um, And some of them uh, were recognized to be kings. Like these might have even been kings themselves. I bet we never even thought about that. And there may have been up to 10 of them. It doesn't say anywhere in Scripture that there were only three. But because there were three gifts, we assume, okay, there were probably three magi. Um, But, yeah, just some interesting facts about them. But let's take a look at the Scriptures. If you have your Bible, we're reading out of Matthew 2, 1 through 12. The visitors from the east, the story of the magi. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. And... It's going to be up on the screen if you're too lazy. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I miss those back in the day when you, like, hear the pages flip. Now it's just, like, you don't hear anything. It's the phone or it's the screen. It's okay. It's nostalgia. Yeah, I'm really dating myself, I guess. I'm older than you think. (laughs) All right, so we'll start in verse 2. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as everyone and everyone was in Jerusalem. He called a meeting and, uh, of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. This is in Micah. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with his wise men, because he was freaking out, and he said, (laughs) poor guy, he learned, uh, I was researching about Herod, and he he was a pretty paranoid king. He did not want to lose his power, and you can see that in what he did. Um, He learned from them the time when the star first appeared. He then told them, go back to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, 
Come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Liar. I don't know if you know the full story, but this man's a liar. After this interview, <laughs> the wise men went, <laughs> they went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them, and they stopped, it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down. They worshipped him. They opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Let's take a second and pray here. Jesus, we just pause. And Lord, I just pray that you communicate through me, Lord. I am not fit to be up here. There's, not, there's nothing that I bring to the table, Lord. But I know that you have a word. I know that you have encouragement. I know that you have correction. You have something that you want to speak tonight. And Lord, I just pray that you use me, that I would, be, I would be found worthy in this moment for you to use me and speak to our church, Lord. Jesus, fill me with your spirit. I pray that, um, that your word is spoken clearly and that it ministers to every heart here tonight, God. We want to honor you. We want to love you. We want to glorify you in all that we do. So Jesus, help us grow. Help us grow in a community together and learn what you have to say. In your holy name, and everybody said, amen. All right. As I mentioned, after reading that, the deepest longing of every human heart is to be loved and to be led. And until that longing is met, we may never truly be fulfilled. Loved and led. When you think about the scripture that we just read, you look at the prophecy in Micah, it says, for a ruler will come from you. Um, that's the idea of love. This, this love is not like the love, the watered-down American love that we talk about. Love you. See you later. You know, we say, we throw this word around so much, but really this is like, this is the agape love. It's a sacrificial love. Or it's this understanding of an unconditional love. We have no concept. We can't do that with each other. Our love is conditional because we're, we're flawed people. It's what we bring to the table. By design, <laughs> we can't do that. But God is the only one who can offer an unconditional love. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a love that is built on forgiveness which is something that we can do, but it's, it's always based on conditions. It's never perfect. Um, so no earthly relationship could fulfill the one that Jesus offers. It doesn't matter what you've done. His love remains, and praise God for that. My poor son, he doesn't agree with what I'm saying right now. It's okay. I'll, I'll tell him about it later. Uh, so, and then the other idea uh, in, in the prophecy, it says, who will be a shepherd for my people. So it's foreshadowing that God, God's going to be the leader. He's going to lead. Uh, and that obviously the idea of like the, he is the good shepherd. Shepherds were uh, protectors. They, they used to carry uh, rods that would like ward off against wolves and other predators to keep the sheep alive. Um, they were sustenance. They found fresh grass whenever the sheep needed it. And also they were the keeper. Like Jesus says, he knows his sheep by name. And we, can, we know his voice when we hear his voice. So this is all like a foreshadowing of actually what our deepest longing in our heart is, to be loved and to be led. And man, if God didn't offer those things, we would just be wandering forever. We would never be full. There would be no hope <laughs> for, for anything. We'd just be wandering forever, and, and we would ultimately live in despair. There'd be no hope for anything. So I have a question for you and for myself, for all of us here. What would life look like if we never encountered the true king? So just take a second and just, just think about it. What what would my life look like if I never encountered the true king? And I don't mean in the trivial way, like, oh, I know, now I know of Jesus, and, you know, my life is going to be a little different now because I, I know him, and this is a nice thing. I mean, like, boom, you come face to face with the true king, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what that looks like. But what would life look like? Um, I, fig I figured there are, like, three outcomes to answer that question. The first would be these people, like I mentioned, that would just be looking forever. They, they know that there's something there. They're on a quest, this never-ending quest in life, to fulfill that deepest longing, because we all have it. We want to find purpose. We want to find meaning. We don't want to get to our deathbed and look back and say, what in the world did I do with my life? We want it to mean something. Um, and it's kind of eating away at you <laughs> until you find that, 
until you come face to face with something that actually brings you life, and brings you purpose. Um, I mean, you can think of things like searching for success at work. Um, I mean, I am definitely guilty of that. Uh, every moment of recognition, every accolade kind of bolsters you up a little bit, and you feel like that might bring you that might bring you one step closer to that deepest longing, longing to be a provider, to be successful. But man, you'll never find it there. <laughs> that's, that's the created. That's like literally never going to offer you anything. Um, you might try to find it in your relationships. But man, relationships can't compare. Again, that's the created. We are fault. We're always at fault. We'll never live up to what Jesus offers. Even this might take some of us aback, and I hope you understand. I hope you know where I'm coming from here. Our attempts to be righteous, our attempts to please God, fall short. Even in our attempts to, <laughs> to glorify the Lord, um, it's, the scripture considers it tattered rags. It's nothing in comparison to the, what the Holy Spirit does in us, that he breathes life into that. Um, so, I mean, I'm thinking of things like giving away money to like, people on the side of the street. You give away a little bit of money to somebody as you're like, you know, doing your thing, and you're like, oh, Okay, I feel pretty good about that. I don't know if anybody's done that, but I've actually done that. You give away a little money, and you're like, hmm, all right, we'll go about our week. But uh, yeah, no thanks. That's not what that does. That's helpful maybe for a moment. Maybe it's not. But <laughs> um, that, yeah, even our attempts to be righteous fall short. Um, putting others above yourselves. Like you think in our attempts to be nice to people, and maybe like you let somebody cut in front of you in line at ShopRite. ShopRite's new to me. It's giant and in Pennsylvania, so getting used to saying that. I actually did that uh, just a week ago. Somebody was behind me, and I was like, I'm going to love on Robbinsville and let this person cut in front of me. And they cut in front of me. I was like, I'm ministering. And then I was like, what am I doing? Like, it doesn't even, it's nice to do that, but even in my pursuit of being righteous, it's nothing. It's, it needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, it is not the ultimate thing that I'm looking for. It's a, it, it's kind of like a, a facet of it. Um, or like, you know, I also thought of like getting up early to do devotions, committing to doing that. This is, this hits home for me. I don't know if anybody else is like this, but really hard for me to get up early. I'm a night owl. Anybody? No? Thank the Lord for night owls. I just, there's something about when the sun goes down and the world is asleep, that's where I belong. Because I know nobody's going to knock on the door or text me and I could just do whatever the heck I want. <laughs> Love the night. Um, but when you do that, you can't wake up early to do your devotions, and it's a problem. So when I choose to do that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to bed early, I'm going to do this thing, um, and I continue to do that. Yes, it's good. It's a beautiful thing, and, and the Lord does honor it, but know that the pursuit of that is not satisfying that deep longing in your heart. That alone is not enough. It's what the Holy Spirit, it's what God breathes through it. Um, everything comes from God, even, in our, even our desire to pursue God comes from God. What would like look, life look like if we never encountered the true king? The other outcome would be you'd be completely in despair. You would, life has no meaning. And there are, how many, we know a lot of people like this in our life. I bet you could think of family members that have just totally given up. And it hurts your heart because you're like, man, like, there's truth out there. I want you to know this thing, but they're done. They don't want to do it anymore. They may have tried at one point, but they've just completely given up. Or another outcome is they settle. And this is interesting. You think of the story that we just read with the Magi, right? They're, they're on a journey. They're on this long journey, and they actually encounter a king on this journey, Herod. Not a great guy, but still was a king. And um, when they met him, they continued to journey. They didn't stop at Herod. It wasn't like they met a king, and they were like, oh, that's good. We, let's give you our gifts that we brought. No. They wanted to keep searching to meet the king, to meet the king of kings. It wasn't enough. And I know this is many Christians in, in, our, in today. Uh, we, we stop at our Herods. Like those, those things where you kind of reach that point where you're like, oh, it's, it's good enough. I met a king. It's okay. I understand what's happening. It's comfortable. It makes sense. Let's stop here. Park it right here, and you never really satisfy that deepest longing that you know is in, it's in your heart. It's in the deepest part of your heart to know Jesus, to be loved, and to be led. 
And when I say no Jesus, I don't mean up here. I mean like, like the transformational no Jesus. Um, yeah, they're, they're the people who settle. It's, it's the complacent duties of the Christian faith in place of transforming power of encountering Jesus. So some questions for us personally. How long have you been on your journey for fulfillment? For fulfillment? We're all in different walks of life. Quite literally, young and old, we're all over the place. We're, we, we are all over the place. Like, I- if you could ask yourself that question, how long have you been on a journey for fulfillment? Are you fulfilled? Do you really feel like you're satisfied in your relationship with, with meaning, with purpose, with Jesus, with your faith? How often do you put your hope in something else to satisfy your heart? And I mean, like, let's honestly ask that question. How often do we do that? Is it really often? Is it never? I mean, like, where do we fall on that, on that pendulum? Just thought-provoking questions. There's a quote from Max Lucado that I think is awesome. It says, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us Elon Musk. I'm, I'm kidding, you know. God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent us a savior. The deepest longing of every human heart is to be loved and to be led. And only a savior who forgives, well, who no one else can forgive, the debt that we couldn't pay, can do that. So what's the solution? <laughs> We've got a problem. There's a, there's a deep longing in our hearts. We're all pretty much flawed in every way. And if you think you're not, come talk to me after. I'll, I'll help you. Yeah, we're... We've all got problems, okay? (laughs) Um, We're all flawed, but what's the solution here? Man, I mentioned it earlier, but Jesus satisfies the deepest longing. That might go in one ear and out the other. You're like, yeah, I've heard a billion sermons. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Anybody know that song? (laughs) So good. I'm not going to keep singing it, but I want to. (laughs) Uh, The Magi, like I mentioned, we're looking for the king, but they really wanted to meet the king of kings. The ultimate truth, the revelation of the scripture that they, the hope of the scriptures, the prophecy that they were clinging to, they wanted to meet that king. Hope incarnate. That was finally there. So until they met him, it wasn't enough. And they continued to journey. Did you know Herod considered himself king of the Jews? We know that as Jesus, but actually Herod considered himself king of the Jews. So he, the ultimate threat that he felt was enough for him to, I don't know if you know the full story, but he ordered that every child under two years old would be killed and that, uh, I mean, obviously threatened his throne. But the Magi themselves met the King of Kings, they gave gifts, they returned what, what the scripture says, filled with joy. They were changed from the transformational experience of meeting the King. And it's so cool to see that here. I bet I could pull a million and one other scriptures of people who've encountered Jesus in one way or another, and you could see black and white. I was this way, I'm now this way. And it's not like magic, but it's like, man, like that's a mark of meeting Jesus. You are transformed. You're filled with joy. It's a mark of meeting the king. Their search was over. God fulfilled the wise men's longing heart. And they found what they were looking for. So I would submit that until we experience the beauty of Jesus, We will expect everything else in life to fulfill that deepest longing. And if we're honest, I really believe that that's true. I mean like the beauty of encountering Jesus, not just knowing him here, not just coming to church and partaking in something nice, which is being together. This is wonderful. This is nice. This was ordained by God, being in church. But it goes beyond that. It it goes to a personal level where you say, Jesus Teach me how to love you. Teach me how to honor you. It's found, I'm going to explain a bunch of ways where, where we can honor God, where we can actually get to that point, but it's pretty simple. But until we actually encounter the beauty of Jesus, we're going to expect everything else in life to do that because we're always on a search for something. We pretty much never stop. Uh, after we encounter Jesus, we live from a place of peace. How many want peace in your life? Is there so much turmoil? I mean, for real, like, it's the world throws so much at us. There's so much. I, I could talk personally of all the junk that's thrown at me all the time. I know we have so many things, but like, man, 
God actually off he is the prince of peace. This is like the source of peace. It's him. Uh, we actually have a firm foundation. I know in life, some of us feel like the rug is constantly being swept out from under us. Like, why is everything always hard? Never easy. He is the firm foundation. And we no longer are searching, wandering, hoping, longing to be fulfilled. We actually, we, we are existing from a place of satisfaction, from fulfillment. And I don't know if some of you are hearing that right now and you're like, I have no idea what that feels like. That's a beautiful thing because Jesus satisfies that deepest fulfillment, that deepest longing. There is an answer. We don't have to wonder. So what do we do about that? It's really simple. Uh, we actually just get up and you just go on a journey to Jesus. <laughs> just get up from where you are and go. Go. That's, we look at what the wise men did, the magi. 10, 20, I don't know how, however many there were of them. They got up and they went. They were observing the stars, and, they, and that the time was right. They got up, and they went. They didn't have to get up. They didn't have to go and do that, but they did it because they knew that he was the king. If we don't get up, if we don't take that step, like, what can the Lord do? I mean, of course, he can intervene anywhere, but there's an act of faith that we have to put in front of us and say, like, God, I want this. Like, Lord, would you honor this? As I take a difficult step, and I do my devotions in the morning, or I do X, Y, Z, like, Lord, honor this. Get up, journey to the king. The Magi didn't stop till they found him. Did you know that on the journey, there were, like, it was, like, not an easy journey? Do you know how long it was? Probably not. It was 900, approximately 900 miles these Magi had to travel. And do you know camels travel at three miles an hour? Three! If we were traveling on the highway at like 70 miles an hour cruise, you put your favorite podcast on, and it's like, oh, I'll be there in no time. Three miles an hour, it probably took them several months to reach where, the, where Jesus was born, and the roads were rough. It was dangerous. There were thieves. Um, there was a good chance of getting lost, even though they were following a star. Um, these men had lives and livelihoods, and they were away from that as they were traveling for all these months. It was, there was taxes as they went in different sects that they had to pay and then also there was like the risk of getting sick like on the road there's no doctors you're just at the mercy of the travel the commitment the persistence of longing for that deepest fulfillment to actually come to fruition they didn't give up they went on the journey i would argue that that's a lot harder than getting up at 7 a.m to spend time with jesus <laughs> if anybody knows what i'm saying like Man, it's easier now. It's easier now to pursue God. It's, it's not, we're not, we're persecuted, but we're not, <laughs> we're not persecuted like, like anywhere near um, some of our folks in like the East today or like even how difficult it was for these magi to travel. Get up. Don't stop until you meet the king. Like I said, we're all on a journey. We're desperate to find fulfillment. So why wouldn't we get up? Why wouldn't we prioritize this? I feel like there are, kind of three kinds of people that, you know, fall into this category here. Um, and I guess for the first person, I would ask, who's at the end of your journey? Like I said, we're all journeying somewhere. We're all going somewhere. You're not just staying somewhere put in life, right? You're always journeying to something. And I think, of like, well, think okay, what do I value in life? What's, what's something that, like, if I lost this thing, I would be shattered? You're probably journeying towards that thing. You know, what is that thing? If you ask yourself, what is, what is that thing? Is that thing success? Is it money? Is it recognition? Um, is, it, is it healthy relationships? Is it physical health? Like, what are those things? Those things are good. Please understand. I'm not saying they're bad, but it's not going to satisfy the deepest longing. So who is at the end of your journey? What is at the end of your journey? Journey to Jesus. Let that be the actual end of the journey. Because I am confident that as you journey to Jesus, those things in some way, shape, or form, form you're going you're gonna to be satisfied in those things. You're not going to be so fixed on receiving praise from people at how good you are at, at your job or, or whatever. Like, you know, uh, how nice of a person you are. Oh, you're, you always have a smile on. It makes you feel good. Like, oh, thanks. Like, yeah, that's who I am, but that's not the end of your journey. Your journey is actually to minister to people. 
to love them through the gifts that God's given you, your personality, your loving. Everyone here is like, I'm not loving. Who are you talking to? <laughs> no, you guys are. Uh, journey to Jesus. You know, we find fulfillment in the search for Jesus. There's something beautiful about, like, getting up and going. And there's something really horrible about not doing it. <laughs> you just kind of slowly wither away and die when you don't pursue Christ. But when you're actually doing it, um, I can speak from personal experience. The Lord just breathes life into it, and it's awesome. In the word, reading the word, things come alive. The Holy Spirit speaks to you as you read the scriptures. And you can find satisfaction in reading the word. You can find satisfaction and fulfillment in praying or abiding with Jesus. It's just as simple as time with God. Spend time with God. It doesn't matter where. You could be in the shower. You could be in the car. He doesn't care. It's literally, Lord, I'm going to give you my time. And you will actually find fulfillment in that. Find Jesus in small groups. Find Jesus in your personal worship. Find Jesus in the community here in church. There's a joy of experiencing the real king. The other question I would have for some of us tonight is, have you stopped your journey at Herod? Have you met a king? It's good enough. I'm comfortable. I'm going to settle. It's okay. We'll give him the gifts. He seems to be happy. <laughs> We're going to settle here. Um, man, there's such a danger in complacency, especially in American culture. Like, the older I get, I'm like, man, it's so easy to be complacent. You can look at all the things in life that are constantly trying to make life more comfortable for us. But it's just making us more dull, you know, to the reality that we don't need these things. We need Jesus. We're completely depraved without him. And, um, yeah, if we stop, if we stop at those things that we think is our end destination, a king, but not the king, we'll, we'll always be searching. We'll never be fulfilled. You'll get to the end of your life and you'll be like, what did I do? What, is it, what does it mean? Did it equal anything? Um, personally, I mean, coming to Life Tree is an awesome thing. God absolutely led this. Um, but, but coming to Life Tree could have been, if I led it, it could be my Herod. Coming here, I came from college admissions, sales. It's a different world, <laughs> okay? It's different. I'm trying to get people to enroll in school and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on their education, which is a beautiful thing. But, uh, <laughs> but it's very different than, like, ministry, than relational ministry like this, pastoral ministry. In my pursuit of this, this could have been, like, being here could have been, okay, good. I'm good. Lord, I'm, I'm on the right track, and I can stop there. But, like, I would only get, like, an eighth of what the Lord actually wants to do through me here. In the same way, um, yeah, I feel like at, like, one of my personal things is that I'm always, I hate it about myself, but I'm really concerned about, like, you know, Vic as provider. I want to provide for my family. It's just something in me. Growing up, we didn't have the most money. My dad is a mechanic. Love him to death. Works so hard. But we didn't have the most money. And so all growing up, I was like, I want to provide for my family. I want things to be comfortable. But the more I pursue that, um, just for me personally, I know that the Lord is like, hey, you, why don't you just trust me, <laughs> and I'll take care of the rest. Don't settle when things feel comfortable, because for me, that can become my Herod. That can become the moment where I'm like, okay, I'm satisfied. Lord, I don't, I don't need anything else because I'm comfortable right now. I'm terrified of that. I don't want that. I want to be used by the king. I want to meet the real king. I want it to change who I am because I want my life to mean something. I don't want to get to the end and, and wonder, like, what the heck did I do? Um, yeah, obviously, I would ask, like, what, you know, what are things in our life that are our Herods? If you asked yourself that question. It's a funny question to ask, but it's really like, what are things in your life that you've reached and you're like, okay, I'm comfortable. We're good. We don't have to, we don't have to figure out what's past this point. I would ask you, have you, have you encountered the beauty of the true king? Can you answer that honestly? It doesn't matter how old, how young we are. This, this is like our relationship with the Lord. And you don't have to be ashamed if you, if you haven't. Like, his mercies are new every morning. <laughs> He's here right now. And it's a beautiful thing. It's easy. We need, to, we need to pursue this because, I mean, some of us might be thinking, like, why, why bother with this, Pastor Vic? Why does it even matter? Can't I just... Be nice to people and do good things, and the Lord 
minister through me in that way? Yeah, of course, but it matters so much because there is so much more on the other side that, like, if you look at scripture, you look at stories of, of what the Lord did through people who totally surrendered every part of their life to Jesus. You see where they either physically encountered the king or it was like through the spirit or something. I mean, their life was so impactful for the kingdom. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I want to be that. I want my life to be that. So, I mean, you could get through life and just be a nice person, but at the end of the day, it's not going to be enough. The scripture says there is no one righteous in Romans. No, not one. What you bring to the table, it's all from God anyway. So there's nothing that we bring to the table that could even come close to what the Holy Spirit can do through us if we just journey to the king. We need to encounter the beauty of the true king because apart from him, there is nothing good in us. Therefore, there is no fulfillment. I'm going to read that again because, and I'm saying a lot of king and beauty and encounter, but really let that, let that phrase sink in. We need to encounter the beauty of the true king because apart from him, there is nothing good in us. Therefore, this fulfillment, this satisfaction that we all deep down want to feel, we all want to feel that purpose and that, that meaning, you'll never find it, <laughs> ever. You'll never find it in anything else unless we experience the true king. How are we doing so far? We doing okay? You all with me? I don't know if I'm pouring it on a little thick, but man, the Holy Spirit has like spoken to me through this sermon this week, and it's just ministering to me. It, I, I need to be reminded of this stuff because it's so, it's so important. I mean, you might, also, you might also ask yourself, how will I know if I've encountered the king? Okay, I understand what you're saying. I get it. He's important. The Magi met the king. They were changed. They went away joyful. Great. Like, how will I know if I've experienced the true king? I know a lot of us have been in church for years. This isn't maybe a new concept to most of us. Meeting Jesus changes everything. It's not magic. It's not like you spend enough time in the word and then all of a sudden you're like, boom, I'm more holy. I think differently, blah, blah, blah. It's a journey, right? It's a journey of faith, but you'll actually see fruit. You'll see transformation. Um, when you find the king, you want to give him your best. I think about Book of the Magi. When they found the king, what did they do? They gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And actually, the cool thing is, gold symbolized, some scholars believe that gold symbolized his kingship, that frankincense uh, was his offering, the offering to him as Lord, deity, and myrrh was kind of a, a symbolism of his burial and his death, because they used to wrap bodies in, in myrrh, like they would, they would, you know what I mean, they would put the myrrh on the body so like as it decayed, it wouldn't be as bad. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a cool concept. But they, these were expensive gifts. These were things that you don't just give away. These were things that were probably their best that they gave to the Lord. How will you know if you encounter the king? You'll want to give him your best. You'll want to give him your first fruits. When I met Caitlin, have you met Caitlin? You all know Caitlin? She's my, she's my woman. She's not here. Yeah, very sad. She's probably taming the child. Life's crazy with three kids, guys. It's wild. <laughs> If you have any tips, please help me. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. No, but when I met Caitlin, um, and I'm sure we could all relate, when, when you meet someone that you start to fall in love with, you want to give them everything. You want to give them not only gifts, but you want to give them your time. You want to give them the best parts of you. You dress a little nicer. You try to present yourself a little better. <laughs> you know, you, you want to give them your attention. And eventually, with Caitlin, I met her in college. Uh, we were both really into music, super cool. Um, and I pretty much wanted to give her everything I had. I wanted to give her all my time to the point where she was trying to practice. We were music majors. She was trying to practice for her senior recital. Caitlin is an insane piano player. You gotta hear her play one time. But I used to like keep her from practicing because I just wanted to hang out. And she was like, you need to let me practice. I'm like, no, let's go outside and uh, do something else. And uh, she did all right. Um, but she probably could have been a better piano player if it weren't for me. I'm okay with that. That was a risk worth taking because eventually I gave her my lifelong commitment. The, the best I could give her because I love her. Because meeting, meeting her transformed who I was. She satisfied a deepest longing in my heart that only a spouse can do. And I know a lot of us can relate to that. 
How will you know when you've met Jesus? You'll want to give him what you have. If you haven't joyfully given to Jesus, I don't mean necessarily just money. I mean like our life. Like what is the Lord asking you when you spend time with him? What do you feel like he's asking you? If you haven't given to Jesus with joy, maybe you haven't met him. Maybe you haven't met him. That's a mark of meeting Jesus, is giving with joy. Lord, I love you so much, I'm going to give you gold frankincense and myrrh, some of the most expensive things. You know, that's just an example, but man, what, what, what a statement. What can we give to the king? You'll no longer be searching for fulfillment because Jesus is enough. Uh, one of these really cool things that is a result of meeting Jesus is you'll want to tell the world what you found. How many of us, when you find, oh my gosh, how many times do you meet that one like family member where they're wearing something and you're like, oh, like nice, nice shoes, Marshalls. You know what I mean? Like they can't not tell you where they got it. They have to tell you because it's a great deal. I, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, I, I got to watch what I'm doing here. I can't, <laughs> yeah, maybe I, uh, Marshalls. Um, yeah, they, they tell you, they tell you what they found, a great deal because, um, because it's awesome. They want to share it with you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or they find a gem of a restaurant, something that is the best food in the area. I've, Pastor Dan has told me of so many pizza places. The same pizza place multiple times has told me I need to go. I don't remember the name of it, but <laughs> I'm gluten-free. I can't even go there anyway. But, uh, but I know beca- because he encountered something that is so beautiful that changed his life. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there was a deep longing in his heart <laughs> for good pizza, and he can't stop telling people about it because it's the best, and hands down. You look him in the eye, you know he's encountered something true, something life-changing. This is what I'm talking about. When you encounter the, be- I hate that I just compared Jesus to pizza, but you know what I mean. The beauty of meeting the true king, you can't help but share. And I don't mean from the side of the street. I just mean like your neighbor's the people you work with, your family members who are on the fence. You can't help but share because it changed your life. I want you to experience this love, this joy. What's changing me is so beautiful. How could I keep from telling people about this? If that doesn't resonate with you, if you're like, I don't feel that, maybe we haven't met the true king. Maybe we haven't experienced the beauty of Jesus. You'll hear from God. This is beautiful. Uh, this, this is really cool because the Magi followed stars before they met Jesus. They were, they were looking at the stars, reading, and that's how they knew. After they met Jesus, what happened? God spoke to them in a dream. Hey, don't go back this way because this is a bad idea. Go this way. They went following stars their own way. They left hearing from the Lord. Encountering Jesus allows you to hear from him. It gives you ears to hear. It's such a beautiful thing. I have a quick story. I'm probably. Oh, we're doing okay. Look at that. Let's go. All right. Yeah. Um, Quick story. Uh, And I'll try and keep it really quick. But I went through an awesome transformation in my life. And it was like maybe two years ago. I was going through some health stuff, um, some like GI stuff. And um, I was also going through some faith stuff at the time where I I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to be around the community felt like it was kind of lifeless and my faith I wasn't doing devotions I wasn't doing like the things you should do and my faith started to atrophy just from the core it was like I knew God I I knew him I was a Christian I am a Christian but but like it it meant nothing to me there was no transformation and when this health stuff came on I it really it turned me back to Jesus because I was like Lord like what's going on here what am I going to do like I need you, Jesus. So I, I like, even though I didn't know what was going to happen, I just chose to start reading the word again. And it was a long time. It was like maybe a year that I wasn't reading the word and that I was just kind of like doing my own thing. I could feel myself just like dying on the inside. It was horrible. I don't wish it on anybody. Being away from Jesus is, is sad. It's a sad way to live life. But um, it came to a point. Caitlin's mom passed away. We were up in Maine, which is where she's from. And my pains were bad, and I was reading the scriptures, and I read in Hebrews, and it was like uh, something to the, de- to the degree of like, and the Lord like didn't hear, f- he chose not to hear from them because 
um, of their wicked deeds. Like they did, they did so much that the Lord didn't hear from them anymore. That their reward basically came in full. They ignored the Lord for so much. They did so many wicked deeds and he was like, okay, we're done. And I read that and I just had this pit in my stomach like, oh my gosh, is that me? Like I'm trying to do these things, Lord. I, I want this again, but I can't hear you. I can't feel you. Like what is this? What are we doing here? And I remember crying, and I'm not much of a, now I am, but I really wasn't back then. I was, I was like in Caitlin's closet. It was like musty and whatever, and I was just praying, and I was just like, Lord, please let that not be me. I need you to speak to me. I need to hear from you. I need something. Speak to me, Lord, because I want to follow you, but like this just doesn't feel real right now. And that day, uh, her friend, Kristen, who lives up in Maine, doesn't, know anything about me or what I'm going through. She just sends a text and it word for word described every symptom I was experiencing. She said, I, I feel like the Lord is telling me you're experiencing these things and that he wants to see wholeness and restoration in your body. And she was like, I'm praying for that. I hope this encourages you. If this doesn't apply to you, just forget it. She was just like, I just feel like the Lord is telling me just to tell you this. And guys, I can't, <laughs> I can't explain I read that scripture, and like, I encountered the beauty of Jesus in that moment because I knew God heard my prayer, not only heard my prayer, but did something he didn't have to do, did a miracle through someone who didn't know anything about what I was going through, just so that I could know, hey, Vic, I hear you, I love you, it's okay, it's going to be all right, and I just like, I just like wept. I was looking at the phone, and I was like, God, you are so good. Like, what? you didn't have to do this, but you love me so much. Like, why? Of all the time I spent going in the opposite direction, you love me so much that you would do that for me. For me. <laughs> like, wha- who am I? I? And I really mean that. I'm nobody. <laughs> I'm up here today. I'm, I'm a normal person. You know, like, what is normal? I'm, I'm really a nobody, and the Lord did that for me because, because, because I journeyed to Jesus. Because I said, I value you, Lord. I know this is true. Lord, speak. I want to hear from you. And he did. <laughs> like, this is, the re- this is the one true God that really spoke to your boy. Okay? Incredible. Like, insane. But this is what he does. And this is what happens when you encounter the beauty of Jesus. He speaks. And that moment, that was actually the moment in my life where, like, 180. Completely changed. Everything is different now. I can't listen to a worship song without, like, crying. I was just like, why me, Lord? Like, the grace of God is such a beautiful thing. But until you experience it for yourself, it really, it means nothing. They're just songs. It's just truths about a good guy. You know, like, it really, it stays here. But the Holy Spirit bridges that gap. And that's what happens when you meet the real king. That's what happened to the Magi when they met the real king. Two last things, real quick. When you meet the real king, you'll step into God's love. Like I just mentioned. This, when I think about the grace of God, my position in the story of the grand, the grand story of Jesus, like, oh, Lord, that you do anything for me, how good is the Lord that we get to worship him, that we get to be a part of this? Oh, my gosh. And lastly, you'll be led, like the Magi were led. God didn't have to redirect them. He could have been like, okay, go to Herod, let's see what happens. But Herod would have probably figured out where Jesus was, and we wouldn't have the Jesus story <laughs> today. You know what I mean? Like God knew he was sovereign and he led the Magi. And that's a result of encountering the king. Your life will never be the same. All these nuances and so much more. That's not even in this story. It changes who we are. And it's such a beautiful thing. So the Magi, the story is a beautiful thing. I mean, I want to take just a minute here. I want to actually just worship together. I do worship here, so I'm going to handle this transition. (laughs) But if you guys wouldn't mind, you want to stand with me? Just going to, we're just going to kind of acoustic here, just sing hopefully a familiar song. It's called Build My Life. Um, I don't know if we've heard of it before, but it sings some truths that I think are really important for us to just remember as we consecrate our hearts and our minds, like, Lord, We want to encounter, we want to encounter you, Jesus. We want to encounter your beauty because nothing else satisfies. Lord, I pray that you would, that you would inhabit our praises in this moment, Lord. As we worship you, Jesus. 
we sing a song of declaration to your name, Lord. Because you are worthy. Because we look in scripture and we know this is what you do. Freely given. Freely we receive, Lord. Freely we receive, Jesus. We journey to the kingdom. Let's sing, worthy of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever give. You're worthy of every breath we could ever We live for you. Jesus, the name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Lord, you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. God, we live for you. We sing holy. to journey to the king that we don't want life to pass us by and not encounter the beauty of the true king just say a prayer to the king this morning just lift up your prayer Jesus we want to encounter you Lord we want to be changed by your presence we want to build our life on your love Jesus you are worthy I will build my life. And I will build. 
Lord, there is nothing like following you. We want to experience the beauty of meeting the real king. Jesus, I pray that wherever we are in our walks in faith, Lord, that the word you've spoken tonight would prompt us. It would not just be a good word, Lord, but it would be a transformational word. It would be a catalyst for your Holy Spirit to do something in our life, God. For those who need to be shaken up, Lord, I pray that, I pray that you would do that, Lord. I pray you would do that, Jesus. Because we want to be powerful for your kingdom, Lord. We want to experience the true king so that we can be transformed into your likeness. So that we can be used for your glory, Lord. It's why we're here, Lord. It's freely given. What a beautiful thing. We love you, Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for the stories and scripture that we can look back on. We can see, look what God has done. Look how good the Lord has been. So we thank you, Lord. We just bless you with our time tonight. We bless, bless you with our community, Jesus. May we bless you as you go. Lord, fill us with your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen.